like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore uh, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine's Healthy Longevity Webinar Series. Happy New Year. This is the first one of the year. Uh, and I'm coming to you tonight from San Diego at three in the morning. <laughs> so I'll do my best. Uh, but it's an exciting uh, show. We have uh, Linda Partridge on, who I think many of you have heard of. Uh, and before we get to her, though, we're going to have a a brief update. And I want to remind you as well to use the Q&A function to ask questions throughout the show, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, so we're going to have Sharmila Kumar, a research associate with the Center for Healthy Longevity, talking about guidelines for exercise, aging, and frailty. Thank you for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. As mentioned, I'm working in Brian's lab as an RA. Today, I'm going to speak about the relevance of aging and exercising. The paper I'm referring to is from Swinger Nature. The title of the paper is Exercise, Aging, and Frailty. Guidelines for Increasing Function are done by R.A. Merchant, J.E. Morley, and M. Cusido, who are actually from our very own NES, St. Louis University, Navara Institute of Health Research, and Institute of D. Soldo Carlos. The population is growing older globally at an exceptional pace from 900 million of them more than 60 years old in 2015 to 2 billion in 2050. The longer lifespan is due to the advancement in public health, medical and social development. However, the health span has been slow to improve in most countries where the last decade of life is spent in poor health. Aging is related to declines in functional capacity and preserving function along with lengthening health span. It is also an increasingly important venture for the nations with quick growing older populations. The World Report on Aging and Health by WHO defines healthy aging as a process of developing, maintaining the functional ability that enables well-being of an individual. Physical inactiveness, social isolation accompanying growing older leads to decline in muscle strength, muscle tissue, and speeds up frailty, worsens chronic conditions together with hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, depression, and dementia. Currently, there aren't any pharmacological agents to slow down aging. However, the physical activity consisting of workout training has been proven to steer key drivers of aging. Exercise improves physical features and the quality of life, reducing chronic diseases. WHO is suggesting to be involved in physical activities at least three days a week, which enhance functional balance and preventing falling older adults and those who are with also with chronic diseases. 
Aging is a risk factor for chronic diseases, frailty, and dementia. Likewise, chronic diseases accelerate biological aging and frailty as well. Frailty is a clinical state that decreases functional reserve, which is correlated with negative health issues, such as disability and mortality. The best approach known is exercising, which improves physical impairment associated with frailty. The type, intensity, frequency, and the duration of the physical activity still continues to be an area of study for many. Pre-frail and frail adults are specifically vulnerable to unfavorable results of hospitalization. Specifically, practical decline and delirium as shows in figures. It is suggested in hospital for supervised exercise as it shows effectiveness in reducing functional decline. The example of exercise wheels for different functional level that includes different, function, different workout series and repetition which are also suggested to be done every week by the patient under supervision. Healthy aging and increasing health span should be a public health precedent for every nation. Physical activity, including exercising, training of low or moderate intensity has been discovered to be effective in enhancing physical function, even in frail older adults. Thank you for listening. Thanks a lot. Um, Linda Partridge, uh, there's a lot of titles I have to read out here, so uh, bear with me just a second. <laughs> She's the founding director of the Max Planck Institute for the Biology of Aging in Cologne, uh, the biological secretary of the Royal Society in the UK, and affiliated with the Institute for Healthy Aging and the Research uh, and the Department of, uh, sorry, Genetics, Evolution, and the Environment at the University College of London. Uh, Linda, you know, we've known each other for a, a long time. It's great to have you on the show and hear about aging. And you're going to tell us tonight, can we cure aging? I think that's what everybody wants to know. So. Thank you very much, Brian. It's, it's great to see you. And um, hello, everybody, that in this case, from uh, London at uh, about 11 o'clock in the morning. So we've got a truly global distribution of time zones for this one. So can we cure aging? Indeed, uh, should we cure aging? As we've just heard um, very eloquently, we're looking at a long-term increase in life expectancy around the world. Um, this is just a paper that came out recently um, with very accurate data from the countries um, shown down the vertical axis here, allowing them to project forward to 2030 and what the expected life expectancy will be for women and men by then. And for all of them, there's a projected increase, although these increases are happening fastest in the middle income countries at the moment. Um, a lot of the countries with very high life expectancy are not showing such a big increase. But anyway, by 2030, South Korea, the world leader, um, Singapore is about a third of the way up in uh, both women and men. And again, as we've heard, this increase in life expectancy, it is something to be celebrated. We're keeping ourselves healthy, so for a given age, we are in better shape. But it's revealing the fact that advancing age is the major risk factor for loss of function and also for outright diseases. So this is actually a joint uh, piece between me and Brian um, produced last year um, with the help of a graduate student, Matthias Fonte Alba, who did the analysis that you see here, which is for two low, two middle and two high income countries and the incidence of cardiovascular disease, dementias and cancer at the bottom in the two sexes in the different colours. We actually adjusted this to take account of the fact that the medical systems in these countries um, a, a more or less intense, but it doesn't matter how you cut it. These very serious and prevalent conditions all increase dramatically with age. And of course, that's also leading to multimorbidity, the presence of more than one condition in a single individual, which is hard to treat. Um, so 
there's a problem. And my view about should we cure aging is that the major burden of ill health is now often falling on the older section of the population. And we have to find ways of keeping people healthier for longer at the end of their lives. And I very much um, support the geroscience approach. I, I, I know Brown does too, which basically says, well, aging, mechanisms of aging are the underlying risk factor for all these conditions and for loss of function. So perhaps if we can intervene in them, if we could first of all discover what they are, and manipulate them in people, perhaps we can prevent these conditions and even prevent more than one simultaneously, since evidently aging is the major risk factor for all of them. And in recent years, we've learned huge amounts about mechanisms of aging, mainly due to these characters, the laboratory model organisms. So we've got yeast, nematode worm, Drosophila and mouse. I actually mainly work with these two at the bottom and also a bit with data from humans. And because of the very powerful evolutionary conservation of biological mechanisms, we can often make a discovery in one or more of these little organisms, um, which turns out to be evolutionarily conserved between them. And then we can go forward to the, the much trickier, more demanding work with the mice. So really, these are, are discovery organisms for mechanisms. And what we've learned from that, I hope it's illustrated here. Um, so these are our basic mechanisms in the middle. I'm sure many of you have seen this one before. Uh, probably everything kicks off with things going wrong with the genetic material, damage to um, DNA, uh, the way it's packaged, the way it's expressed, so that the whole control of gene expression in the cell goes down. So it loses control of its proteins, of the powerhouses of the cell, the mitochondria, which have a lot of other functions too. Um, the way that the, the cell senses nutrients and signals from other cells, growth factors and so on becomes impaired. Um, cells become senescent and, and damaging. They should be cleared by the immune system, but they no longer are. Stem cells start misbehaving and the whole systemic environment tends to become pro-inflammatory. Inflammation is a very characteristic feature of aging and other things go wrong. And these processes happen to different extents in different tissues, different types of organisms. They interact with each other, but between them, they give rise to the subclinical and clinical things that go wrong during aging in humans. So from gain of fat, for example, through to age-related diseases, multimorbidity and frailty. And we've got this battery of interventions on the left. So we've already heard a lovely uh, description about helpful interventions with exercise in humans and still diet and exercise are two of the most powerful interventions that we have there. But even people who lead a blameless lifestyle and live in an excellent environment develop the ills of aging. And the discovery of, of this set of mechanisms has come from the genetics. But we're now, I think, set to actually start to think about intervening uh, with drugs and also natural metabolites in ways that might prevent these aging related conditions from happening. Now, I don't know to what extent uh, you would accept the idea that we might swallow a pill to actually improve our health during aging. People I think often find that a rather unfamiliar idea, but actually to a large extent, we're doing it already. So many people, for instance, are taking statins over very long periods, but to prevent atherosclerosis, not because they've got it. And similarly with pills that prevent high blood pressure, these are preventative, they're not treating diseases, they're trying to stop the disease occurring. So I think the principle is very well established. The question is whether we can expand it. I think there would be considerable challenges for developing new anti-aging drugs, although I think this will have to happen in some contexts. So cellular senescence is an obvious target where new drugs are being developed. But it, it would be a huge challenge for the pharmaceutical industry to come up with a new drug where we treat a wide uh, range of the population with multiple outcomes over a long period. That's going to be incredibly expensive. It had better be extremely safe because otherwise the regulators are not going to like it. But the nice thing is that I think we have a considerable opportunity for drug repurposing. So using existing drugs that are used to treat particular conditions, but now using them usually at lower doses with fewer side effects preventatively. I'm particularly interested in that nutrient sensing network that we mentioned. So these are the mechanisms by which cells sense um, their nutrient status, how well fed they are, are they stressed? 
Are they infected? What are other cells saying to them? Are there growth factors around? And on that basis, decide what costly activities they can undertake. Can they grow? Can the organism reproduce? How is it going to set its metabolism? That's the network I'm particularly interested in. And it seems so, so we're talking here about insulin, insulin-like growth factor. For those of you familiar with it, the TOR protein complex within cells. And that whole system seems to be very well set to function in youth. But as organisms get older, it drives too strongly in their cells. So mildly tamping down its activity can improve health during aging and extend lifespan in all of the laboratory organisms. This is the result of a lot of work in a lot of different labs, really starting with the work of Cynthia Kenyon uh, with the worm. And we're very interested in the potential for drugging this network. So this is a cartoon of how it looks in Drosophila, um, but there are similarities uh, with mammals. So we've got the cell here with its membrane and its nucleus. There are ligands that circulate, so insulin and IGF in mammals interact with the receptor. And then you've got all these characters in the cells, different proteins that communicate with each other, eventually to alter the activity of these in the nucleus. So these are the transcription factors that turn on and off the activity of genes. So what this network does is to listen to what's going on externally, to sense nutrients internally, and then alter gene expression accordingly. And we're very interested in three drugs. Um, one of them is lithium, one is trametinib, and the other is rapamycin. And I'll just briefly describe the three to, them, um, to you and where, where we've got with them as a, a community. So lithium used to be used to treat bipolar disorder, and it interacts with this bit of the network. And we got um, interested in it because of its effects in the worm. So several labs have shown that if you feed worms lithium, they can live longer if you get the dose right. Lithium is actually dangerous at high doses. So we've got the black control here, a maximum increase in lifespan at about 10 millimolar, this dose in the food. But if you go over that, then you shorten lifespan eventually below controls, it's toxic. And one of these papers also did a very nice demographic analysis with humans in different prefectures in a part of Japan and showed an association between low overall mortality and high levels of natural lithium in the drinking water. So again, suggested. So based on that, we had a look at the fly. And um, this was the work of Jorge Castillo Pan, who's now in Harvard. And we found something very similar to the worm. So an increase in lifespan at lower doses, but toxic at very high doses. So armed with that, we decided to go forward to the mouse. And I'm showing you this just to impress you that these things don't always work. Evolutionary conservation is powerful, but in this case, it failed. So what we've done here is to very carefully feed lithium to mice, avoiding toxicity. So the first form of toxicity is to their kidneys, and we can detect it by looking at the appearance of the kidneys. And what we found using two different types of the drug, both sexes of mice, different strains, and staying below, just below kidney toxicity, is that the first thing that we see in the middle here is actually a reduction in the lifespan of the mice. So there isn't a sweet spot for lifespan as you take the dose of the drug upwards. The first thing you see is toxicity. And we didn't see any indications of improved health during aging either. So this was one where the invertebrates were not helpful. There could be a lot of reasons for that. We can discuss it afterwards if you'd like to. Um, but let's move on to the next one, which is trametinib. So this bit of the network here is actually very important in cancer. This is the RAS pathway. So there are many existing drugs against it. And trametinib is one that was produced by GlaxoSmithKline, and it's used to treat malignant melanoma, and it inhibits this bit of the pathway. And again, we became interested in this pathway because of genetic evidence from our own lab with Drosophila and um, also the work of Walter Longo who's worked on this pathway. So what we did first of all was to establish that the drug works beautifully in flies, just as it does in humans. So it inhibits this mech in the pathway, as I've said. And what these blobs on the right tell us that in Drosophila cells, which is what we're looking at here, so fly cells, as we increase the dose of the drug to the cells, we see a reduction in the effect of MEC on ERK, which is represented by these blobs. And it's also reasonably specific. So if we look at its effect on other kinases, AKT and S6K, nothing happens. So it seems to work nice and specifically in the flies as well. And if we feed it to them, we see a dose-dependent increase in lifespan at these lower doses. 
If we overdo it, again, it's toxic, uh, particularly to young and middle-aged flies, although we see a nice extension of maximum lifespan. So this suggests that the effects of the drug are age-specific. And indeed, if we just give it to flies when they're older, it seems to work um, very nicely. So this is a case, I'm happy to say, where things do seem to be translating to mice, because here is an experiment that hasn't quite finished yet, that's going on in my lab in Cologne in Germany. Missonia, the student, is doing it. And you can see in mauve, in the treated mice, both males and females, they're showing extended lifespan. And we're doing a lot of work on the health status of these animals and on the fly to understand exactly how health is being improved. We know what the molecular target is, but that doesn't tell us exactly why it is that the animals are doing better. You can see that the effect here is slightly sex specific. So it's more in males. And indeed, we found as we edged up the concentration of the trametinib that we were giving the mice, it was the males first who showed an extension of lifespan. And only when we come up to the dose that you're looking at, do we see an extension in females as well. And this is quite common that there are sex differences in the responses to drugs. And that's going to be very important, I think, also with geroprotective drugs. Finally, uh, rapamycin which interferes with this um, complex of proteins in the cells that's particularly responsible for detecting the amino acids that are derived from proteins in the diet, but also other inputs. Um, mTOR1 is a real cellular crossroads mm -hmm. that senses many things and influences many downstream pathways. And it, it's probably the most advanced of our geroprotective drugs at the moment, it and other chemicals that have similar effects. So it extends lifespan very nicely in flies. Um, this is Ivana who did the work. She has her own lab at the UCL Cancer Institute now. And you can see the dose dependent increases in lifespan here. And what we can do in flies relatively easily is to give the drug to mutant animals and ask, well, what's the target of the drug? And what she found was that uh, this autophagy turned out to be very important. This is a cellular cleanup process by which cells get rid of damaged bits, proteins that have stuck together or aren't folded properly. It, it's really a, a sort of um, getting rid of the cellular garbage process. Um, and th uh, there was another target as well, the S6 kinase. And we've been doing quite a lot of work on the mechanisms in Drosophila based on identifying these targets. And I'll just tell you a couple of things that I think are quite interesting. First of all, it turns out this autophagy is important in just one type of cell in the gut. So this drug is extending the lifespan of flies by doing something in the gut. So this is uh, demonstrated here. This is the work of Paula and Sebastian. And what they've done here, and these are survival curves, is to either feed the flies rapamycin so we've got the controls and the black dots, rapamycin in black. We've seen already it extends their lifespan. But they can also genetically increase this autophagy process, but just in the cells in the gut. So you can see here in the fly that there's a big deterioration as the fly gets older in the um, appearance of the gut. It's lovely and orderly to start with. By the time the fly's old, you can hardly tell that it's a gut and it becomes leaky. Things get into the main body of the fly that shouldn't. Rapamycin completely rescues this. And if we just increase autophagy in these cells in the gut, we get just as big an extension as we do with rapamycin. And if we put the two together, they don't add on to each other. So they're the same, they look as though they're the same process. So I think we conclude that the gut is really important here. This may be partly because of the health of the gut. It could also be that the gut is actually affecting health of other parts of the fly. This is something that we're examining at the moment. But I think the gut is really important and it's looking as though it's similar in the mouse. And the other very important message from the fly work is it looks as though very short term treatment with these drugs, which of course are already being used at lower doses than clinically, may be sufficient to get the effects that we want. So this is shown here. This is the work again of Paula. And what you're seeing here in black is exactly what you've seen before, that rapamycin extends the lifespan of the fly. But what she's done in red is just to treat them with the drug for the first couple of weeks after their adult flies. And then she takes the drug away from that group. And we can see them signaling to talk from talk came back to normal. But if she then waits for a few weeks until the flies start to die, this early treatment on its own is sufficient to extend their lifespan just as much as giving them rapamycin for the whole of the time that they're adults.
So it's possible that intermittent treatment, just quite brief treatments, certainly with rapamycin, um, but also possibly with these other geroprotective drugs may be sufficient. And this one has gone away along the path. So this was established um, some years ago with the intervention testing program in the US. Uh, rapamycin extends lifespan beautifully in mice. Um, the drug was actually discovered in soil on Easter Island, hence the heads that are appearing here. An expedition went to find chemicals that inhibited the growth and division of mammalian cells. And lo and behold, it really extends lifespan in mice. And we don't know what the maximum extension is yet. The dose dependence here, we're getting the maximum extension with the maximum dose. So th this really is a, a very valuable drug, I think. And it's being taken forward, I think, through the trailblazing work of Joan Manning, who's um, doing work looking, I think, taking the drug through to translation to humans in the way that this will probably happen for these established drugs, looking at one particular condition first, but then seeing how broad we can go. So what she's done here is to show that, not rapamycin itself, but very similar drugs, actually enhance the response of older people to immunization against flu. So we don't respond so well once we're over 60. And uh, what she found based actually on earlier animal work was that a pretreatment with an inhibitor of TORT1 enhanced the immune response to the immunization itself and lowered viral respiratory infections in the ensuing winter. And of course, now she's very interested in this possibility in the context of, of COVID. But I think this is a wonderful example of, of how this work will move forward. Just one last thing. I think it's quite likely that we'll be talking about a polypill rather than a single drug, certainly for this network, but possibly also for other contexts, other geroprotective effects. So for this one, Jorge, who I've mentioned previously at Harvard, actually looked at what happened if we do combinations with the three drugs that I'm talking about. So we've got the control flies here in black. We've already seen that each of the drugs individually in green, yellow, and mauve extends the lifespan of the fly. But he's then looked at the three pairwise combinations of the drugs in dark blue, brown, and light blue. And you can see that you get a bigger extension and you get the biggest extension of all if you feed them all three together. So it really looks as though inhibiting these different nodes in that network is important. And that may be because there's feedback. So if you give one drug, other bits of the network will try to compensate. And if you stop them doing that, you can get the effect that you want. It may be because they're affecting the activity of different genes through different transcription factors. There could be a lot of reasons. They could just have different uh, effects on the same target. I think we don't know what the mechanism of this effect is, but I think the fact that it's there is important. So take home messages. We've got a malleable process here. It's um, malleable to lifestyle, to genetics, to drugs, to nutrition, and its mechanisms are becoming increasingly well understood. Mm. They can be targeted with drugs to improve health and prevent disease. I haven't said so much about that, but it's true during aging in animals. The nutrient sensing networks promising target for repurposing existing drugs. Geroprotective drugs certainly function well at low doses and they may well function also with intermittent treatment. And this network and possibly others may be best targeted with a poly pill. And I'd like to thank our funders who've made the work that I've shown you possible. Also the, the creatures themselves who we work with. Brian, very much for the invitation, and thank you for listening to the talk, and I'll be very happy to discuss it. Thanks, Linda. You know, that mouse is eating a big chunk of cheese. I'm not sure that's a blameless lifestyle. <laughs> it's true. It's true. But it keeps them happy. Well, thanks for the talk. You know, I think it's, it's really exciting to have you on, and, and uh, you've been, you know, a leader in the field for a while now. And uh, so I was just maybe just start for a few minutes by talking about your history in the field and what got you into the aging research. And I know you were doing a lot of other things before that. So uh, what, what excited you about the aging field to start with? Well, I started out life as an evolutionary biologist. So I was interested in population genetics and the way in which different characteristics evolve. And, you know, from the evolutionary point of view, aging is completely peculiar because, you know, development can achieve the amazing feat of building an organism. So wouldn't it be much simpler just to maintain it than to develop it in the first place? I mean, why does aging happen? Why, why do things go wrong at the end of life? Why do we die? And I think understanding 
the evolution of aging and realizing that it, it's evolving as a side effect. Natural selection can't work well at later ages because most of the population already dead. So just because they've been eaten by a predator or they've caught a disease, you know, extrinsic factors. And what that means is that at later ages, there are only a few individuals left alive in the wild. So mutations that affect them at that age encounter a very weak force of natural selection. And understanding that and the fact that natural selection really favours the young at the expense of the old as well, I, I think that is really important for understanding it. So I got into it through the evolutionary paradox and trying to understand the importance of different types of genetic effects in actually producing ageing, given this reduced force of natural selection. And then, of course, I started to get really interested in the mechanisms. You know, I think that's one of the things I've, I've struggled with is that, you know, on the one hand, we talk about, you know, aging is sort of a, what happens when natural selection declines. And on the other hand, we spend a lot of time talking about evolutionarily conserved pathways of longevity across different species. So I'll ask you the question since I have to answer it all the time. Uh, why are things conserved if it's, you know, not uh, under as much natural selection? Well, I think what's conserved is longevity assurance. So the things that are in that wheel of mechanisms of aging, they're things with which things go wrong during aging. The fact that they're there in the first place and doing their, their, their thing correctly in, in young organisms is the product of natural selection. What fails is the ability of natural selection to maintain their activity correctly. So things deteriorate during aging because there's damage, um, because there are bad interactions between cells, because cells are, end up in the wrong place, like macrophages in fat. You know, all sorts of things happen because of a failure to make mechanisms that work well in youth continue to work well in old age. And what our interventions are doing and why they're evolutionarily conserved is that they're trying to reverse that deterioration, but in systems that are present in all organisms. Yeah, so in, in, a, in a sense, things fail in similar ways because the the species, the, the, the organism was put together in such similar ways that the, the failure occurs in a similar way at the same time. So Yes. Yeah. Although uh, obviously, it, you know, it can vary a bit. The actual pathologies that develop in different kinds of organisms can be a bit different. But I find it very intriguing that this gut pathology seems to be very similar between flies and mice. Yeah, no, I want to come back to that for sure. Um, you mentioned the hallmarks of aging. A lot of people have showed that slide. And, you know, I think one of the challenges right now is people are trying to understand if there's hierarchies that connect these different hallmarks and do certain things break down before others. That was kind of alluded to in the first paper that came out. Uh, but what do you, what's your current thinking on that? Are there some hallmarks that are you know, more dramatic or more significant or connected than other ones? That's a tricky question. I mean, I've got a mental picture that the first things that go wrong are with gene expression. So for whatever reason, the way that, I mean, just straightforward mutations and damage to DNA, but you know, also failure of nuclear structure, um, import and export of control molecules into the nucleus mean that gene expression goes down. And you can see that very early on. So if you, you know, look for transcripts of genes, the first stage in gene expression, you know, quite often there are errors there. There are bits missing or duplicated in the transcripts that come off. So I think that has to be really what happens first. But then everything else follows if the cell's not controlling its machinery uh, correctly. In humans, I mean, metabolic disease and age-related inflammation are extremely important, I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean if you fix those two, you'd be a long way down the path to making things better. Which raises the question of whether, you know, those things are so important of humans just because of our non-blameless lifestyle and that we're eating the wrong things and too much of it. I, you wonder, in, I, I wonder in like in healthy populations, if how big of a factor that is or other whether other things are driving aging more? Well, it would have been very nice to get the information while they were still, um, you know, in the 1950s on the Okinawan population because they were so extraordinarily healthy and, and there were very clear lifestyle factors associated with it as there are in the blue zones now. 
but exactly which of those factors is, is the really important one or whether it's a combination and what processes are being affected, it's hard to say. But I do think the laboratory model organisms purely coincidentally are a very good model for humans who are not leading a blameless lifestyle because yeah. neither of the model organisms, when they're practically sitting in their food, they don't get enough exercise, they don't have to fight, they're protected from infectious diseases. You know, they are couch potatoes. So in that sense, I think they're quite useful models. Yeah, it would be interesting. I always wanted to like do experiments where we look at some of these interventions in mice that have a, a more uh, enriched environment and exercise wheels and, and whether, determine whether they would still work or not. I think that people don't want to do that because it's their hard, hard studies to do and they take a long time. The mice it's hard and experience. expensive, but really needs doing, because I'm sure you're right that if you had mice living in a much healthier environment to start with, you know, they, they would live longer and we would probably find that a completely different set of interventions were the ones that could help them. Well, fortunately, the vast majority of humans are living unhealthy lifestyles, so we're okay with the <laughs> current models. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about some of the, uh, the the drugs you mentioned. And you know, I, it was funny. I was reading about uh, lithium just recently because it was actually a product in a in a product uh, a long, long time ago, which was a soda called Seven Up. Uh, and so, I guess we're rediscovering what the uh, soda makers discovered, you know, several decades, many, many decades ago. And it was apparently uh, promoted as seven up as a way to deal with hangovers. So again, uh, targeting people in non blameless <laughs> lifestyles, but uh, yes, well, I hope with lithium that the mouse actually is a good model for humans. Because that, I mean, that epidemiological data from Japan was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think also, you know, the drug has far more targets in humans than it does implies. I mean, in flies, it's very clear that it's just GSK3 that's important. But yeah. we know that in humans, it targets a lot of other things which maybe aren't beneficial. Um, there are a lot of specific GSK inhibitors um, around now because um, it, probably they're going to be useful in neurodegenerative disease. Yeah. And it would be very interesting to try to target that more specifically in the mouse. But it may well be that you know, the best targets are only in certain cell types, and that's always a weakness with drugs. You really need to know what the target is that's producing the beneficial effect and look at whether you're targeting that directly or whether you're so far upstream that you're affecting other things that you don't want to affect. So, you know, I think we just don't know with lithium at the moment, but the results with the mouse don't really encourage much further work on it at the moment. What was the health span data on the mice? How, did you look at a lot of health span parameters? So we, we did all the standards, you know, um, we did uh, insulin sensitivity, um, glucose tolerance, um, activity, Y maze, um, grip strength, uh, some others that, oh, that they went, were in metabolic cages for a while. And the, at the doses that we were working at just sub- damage to the kidneys we just weren't seeing anything at all i mean sometimes you can separate those two the effects on health and the effects on lifespan so for instance we find in cologne with the mice we're working with if we impose dietary restriction really late in life we don't see any extension of lifespan at all but there's a big improvement in metabolic health that mm -hmm. seems to be an acute effect of dietary restriction but there are clearly other heritage effects of having eaten as much as the mouse wanted for most of its life that mean you can't extend its lifespan through that route but you can certainly make it healthier when it's older yeah i think that was there's you know there's kind of a challenge to do those kind of diet interventions in late life anyway i mean with the work we mostly Walter longo did but we were involved with showed that the intermittent fasting there's a transitional period very late in life when uh intermittent fasting is no longer good for the animals. In that case, uh, we were in, you know, the, those mice had been fasted their whole lives, so we weren't able to look for improvements and things that had gone wrong. But it's definitely at some point when these animals go into a more of a frailty mode that they restricting their calories is probably not going to help their lifespan that much. Did it, did it improve their health? Uh, well, again, we had been intermittently fasting them throughout their life. We didn't start an intervention late, so... The animals were much healthier, yeah, but it, it, we were unable to link that to a Hard to say whether that was an acute effect of their current diet or a heritage effect of their earlier diet. 
Yeah. The trouble with these experiments where you do switches is you end up with big numbers of experimental groups and with mice that very quickly gets very expensive. Yeah. The data on trametinib is really interesting. Uh, so the, I think many of our, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because many of our listeners have heard a lot about rapamycin with various shows we've had in the past, but this is a new, a new drug for a lot of people. Um, you know, and it's interesting at the high doses, there's a biphasic effect on lifespan. And you interpreted that as a um, some early stage effect that's toxic at the highest dose so that a lot of the animals die early, but the ones that don't still live longer. We see that with other interventions too. And it makes you wonder, you know, is it just stochastic that some of the animals come through that okay and then they get the benefits late in life or uh, what defines the the toxicity early on? I think there's a huge number of possible interpretations with flies. I mean, there was a lot I, I didn't say because there wasn't time. But for instance, as flies get older, they eat less. And we're not giving them pills. We're giving them a certain dose of the drug mm -hmm. in the food. So if they eat less when they're older, that is going to take them to a lower dose of the drug. So that could be part of the explanation. It could be that it's genuinely toxic when they, and you could sort that out by doing the kind of switch experiments that we've been uh, talking about. So that could be an explanation. The other possible effect is sorting, because if you have a, you know, a population of flies to start with, they, they're not identical. I mean, these, these flies are outbred, so there's genetic variation, which may or may not be relevant. But even in a completely inbred population of worms, you get a big distribution in the yep. ages at which those worms die presumably because they start life more or less robust. And of course, what happens if you have a lot of early mortality is that the survivors are a particularly tough bunch. Mm. And that may also explain the effect, that simply yeah. that they're, they're basically healthier flies than the controls that are left to life. So yeah. I think we need to do other experiments to figure out what's going on there. That's still a sort of an unexplained aspect of aging is the broad you know, range of survivorship, you know, and, and, and genetically seemingly identical uh, individuals within a species. And we see that in yeast, worms, flies, mice, and pretty much everywhere else we look. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the stochastic element of it is still something we haven't wrapped our heads around very well. But you, got, you guys in the worm community have done very nice nice work on that. So yeah. th there have been experiments where people have looked uh, using a reporter at the exp expression of heat shock proteins, just the distribution across the young worms, and shown that that can be quite a good predictor yeah. of their subsequent mortality. So I, th I think you've got a very nice system and have done very nice work in the worm to try and work out yeah. what the origin of some of that heterogeneity is. But that just sort of raises the question of why that distribution is so broad to start. How, how did it, how did that happen in the first place? Yes, we still yeah. really don't understand that. Yeah. yeah, I think it's interesting. So um, you know, it's, it's similar the, with this uh, tratinib that with MEC as a target. It's similar to rapamycin with mTOR as a target, right? There's so many things happen downstream that it's really hard. You, just because you have a target doesn't mean you have mechanism. And uh, so, what are your thoughts on? What the so, so we know a bit from the fly, much more from the fly than from the mouse. So we know that the critical transcription factor, so this, this protein that turns on and off gene expression, um, we, we know what it is in the fly. For what it's worth, it's called anterior open. It's an E26 transcription factor. And it's activated upon inhibition of the RAS pathway, the signaling. So the drug causes it to become activated. And we know what genes it binds to, and we know which, what genes show altered expression in response um, to the drug. And it, it, it's, there's an interesting overlap with an earlier story. So many of you will have heard of the lovely work of Cynthia Kenyon, which really kicked off a lot of this nutrient sensing um, investigation, where she showed that if you lower the activity of the receptor in the worm, um, you extend its lifespan dramatically. But if you remove a particular transcription factor from the worm genome called DAF16, it's a particular kind of transcription mm -hmm. factor, then the worm's okay, but the mutant in the receptor no longer extends its lifespan. And the same is true in flies. There's the exact equivalent of the receptor and of this transcription factor. It's called FOXO. And FOXO and 
the anterior open show very extensive overlap in the genes that they bind to, but not complete overlap. They're tending to slightly different upstream inputs, presumably interacting with slightly different other proteins in the nucleus. So they've got commonalities, but differences in the genes that they affect. So the pot of gold, you know, what exactly they're doing, I think, is, is to do with those changes in gene expression. And, and there, it, it's going to be just like it was with the, the main insulin pathway to FOXO. You know, a lot of work trying to find out what tissue, what cell type, what aspect of health, you know, what mechanism of aging is impacted and how is that affecting health during aging. So I think there's, there's a lot of work to do, but we know what the way in is. You know, you were a little bit too modest in that statement because it was your lab that did a lot of the work on the insulin IGF signaling and the fly and aging. So I uh, just wow. think I would thought I would point that out since you didn't. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about rapamycin. You know, the um, in, we know it enhances autophagy. I think the exciting thing that you showed was that it's really something that's happening in the gut. And uh, that raises several questions. And it, it, in in you know, the gut seems to be particularly important in the fly for aging. And, you know, Henry Jasper's work on activating uh, intestinal stem cells being sufficient to extend lifespan and other interventions. Um, do you think that's more fly specific or are we in the mouse world missing the, uh, I mean, people know that the intestine is important for aging, but we're maybe missing the, the relative significance of it at this point. I suspect a bit of both. I mean, in, in an adult fly, apart from its reproductive system, the only tissues that have stem cells and actively dividing tissue, uh, stem cells is the gut. Um, so the fly gut's relatively simple. There are the big absorptive enterocytes, which are the cells that I've been talking about for the autophagy. There are the stem cells that give rise to them. And there are also some enteroendocrine cells that produce hormones that signal to the rest of the fly at a distance. And we don't know in the fly, and I can't quite think how you would establish it at the moment, whether the improvement in gut pathology is the only thing that's going on or whether we're also changing the way that the gut signals to other tissues. They could be action at a distance. It doesn't have to be just gut pathology. And of course, if you're feeding the drug to any animal, the first tissue that's affected is going to be the gut. That's where it's first encountered. And we know that some similar things are going on in the mouse. So we can show that, um, you know, autophagy is elevated there, there's a reduction in gut leakiness, um, there's an improvement in gut health, panis cells are improved, for instance, uh, by the administration of rapamycin. What we don't know in the mouse is the extent to which that's the story that it kicks off with an improvement in the gut and everything else follows from that, or whether it's having quite separate action in other tissues that's beneficial. And I think it's very important to sort that out because all of these drugs are going to have yin and yang effects. You know, yes, there's a net improvement in lifespan. Yes, there's a net improvement in health, and that's very important. But it may well be that that's a result of a balance between good and bad effects, and we really need to know that. Are there tissues yeah. where the drug isn't so beneficial, in which case should we be trying to target whatever this effect is more to the tissues that are just producing the benefits? And if so, how is it working in those tissues and can we identify targets that are specific to them? Because of course, within limits, a drug gets everywhere. It may not get across the blood brain barrier, but it gets pretty well everywhere else. So if different tissues show costs and benefits, then we actually need to understand more before we've got a really well targeted drug that only produces benefits. Yeah. I agree. Well, one more quick question, then I'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, rapamycin affecting the gut, does it affect the microbiome and is that important? No. So David Walker showed some time ago that if you remove the fly microbiome, rapamycin also or still increases its lifespan. Of course, that doesn't prove that the microbiome isn't playing a role. It just says there are other things going on. Mm -hmm. So we did some additional experiments where we measured the total amount of microbiome that was present in flies that were drugged or not drugged. And we also looked very carefully at the composition, you know, what taxa were there. And we, it's a strange finding, but it doesn't seem to have any effect at all. It, there's still the remaining possibility that it's altering the activity of the microbiome in yeah. some way, but yeah. we can't get any evidence at all of an interaction 
with the drug. Um, as far as I know, no one's done the notobiotic experiments with mice. They've been very, very difficult and expensive to do. Yeah, 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 no, they are. Um, no, that's great. Let me uh, turn it over to um, Shin Yi Tan, who's another re uh, research associate in the Center for Healthy Longevity, and she's been uh, taking in questions from the audience. And so let's see what the audience has to has to say. Uh, Shin Yi. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hi. So the first question that uh, someone would like to ask is currently, what are some realistic and practical therapeutic treatments in preclinical or clinical studies that you feel may offer the best promise of success to improve both health span and lifespan in humans? Maybe you can uh, answer that a little bit broad. Well, you know, we talked about a few things already, but what are some of the things we didn't talk about? Yes, I think the probably the current activity that's going on that most closely addresses what the questioner has in mind is actually the clinical trial that near Basel is leading with um, metformin. So metformin is the you know the current first line of defence against type two diabetes. So it's taken by millions and millions of people, and it's an extremely safe drug. Um, it's a complicated drug because it has multiple targets. It, it's not a simple one. And even for type 2, it's not completely clear what the relevant targets are in humans. And it's a drug that definitely does affect the microbiome in a big way. But it also targets elements of this nutrient sensing network that I've been talking about. So it activates something called AMPK, which is important in regulation of the activity of TOR, which is also, as we've seen, targeted by rapamycin. And I think Brian may know, be more up to date on this than I am, but I think they now have finance for that trial. And it's a very large scale trial. And the interesting thing about it is that the FDA have approved aging as a valid outcome measure for the trial. It's there in the, in the license for the trial. So they're looking at multiple outcomes in a large group of people. Um, who are otherwise healthy, so they're not being treated for type 2 diabetes, uh, but who are administered or not administered metformin. I think the outcome of that trial is going to be really interesting. But as I say, Brian may be somewhat more up to date than I am. Yeah, I think the some of it is funded, and we've had Nir Barzilai on a show about six months ago, and we'll have to bring him on at some point and get an update on where that's going. Yes, I think that's the closest to the kind of thing that the questioner has in mind at the moment. Thank you, Prof. Linda. Um, we have another question from Stephen. Uh, when is the optimal age range to start anti-aging therapeutics, young, middle age, or old, etc.? And would this vary with the class of therapeutics we are talking about, such as senolytics? Yes, that's, that's a really interesting question. And um, it's a very important question. And I think there's still a lot of, of work that needs doing on it. Um, obviously, I, it, if we could, what we would like to do is to delay the start of taking the drug for as long as possible, if we can get the full benefits, as long as we don't leave it too late. Um, so finding out whether a drug administered for the first time late in life can get the full therapeutic effect is important. There have been rather few such experiments, actually, even in the little invertebrates that I talked about, let alone in the mouse. So I think we often don't know the answer. I think we know with rapamycin already in mice that intermittent treatment is good enough and that if you do feed it to the mice for the first time at late age, it extends their lifespan. But we don't know whether it extends their lifespan as much as lifelong treatment or whether they get the full health benefits. So I think the answer to your question is yes, extremely important. And no, we don't know the answers yet for any of these drugs. Do you want just a follow up to uh, one of the uh, experiments that you've done on trimethonib. The data on trimethonib looks promising. It is also an anti-cancer drug. Um, hence, would there be any potential uh, negative side effects if translated in the future? I think we don't know that in humans. And it's going to be very important. in So in humans, generally, if they're being treated with one of these drugs, including rapamycin, but also trimethonib, they're already so sick that it's really very difficult to get any evidence from humans about other effects of the drug than the therapeutic ones for the disease that's being treated. There's just too much else wrong 
to deduce anything. I was hopeful for a while that with rapamycin, it might be possible to get some other information from transplant patients. But what the clinicians always say is that that just isn't going to work because the patients have so many other problems. So I think it, it's difficult to answer that question. Um, in the animal studies, again, I think the evidence is not terribly clear at the moment. Um, it, yeah, I think this is one that's going to come out with time. I think the appeal of maybe doing lower doses for those drugs is something you mentioned and it's something worth uh, uh, you know, saying again, is that the toxic effects at lower doses in healthy people are much more likely to be reduced. The question is whether they still exist over the long term or not. I think we don't know. Absolutely. So when Joan Manick did her two clinical trials um, with her, you know, similar to rapamycin drugs, she essentially saw no side effects. There were, uh, there were some minor side effects, but they were present in the placebo group as well. So these really are very low doses because at clinical doses, rapamycin has quite major side effects. And particularly if we can also use them intermittently, that will reduce yeah. the impact. I do have one more question regarding the polypill uh, experiment. Um, so I think that's quite interesting to show that a combination of rapamycin, lithium and trimethanib actually extended lifespan. Um, but may I know, were there any side effects and uh, or how did the side effects compare to having just each of the drugs uh, done for each of the um, groups? So it's very difficult to measure side effects in Drosophila um, in which that experiment was done. So you can um, look at how active they are, whether they climb well, um, how their fertility is. You know, there are some output measures and they all seem to go with the extension of lifespan. They're, they're all improved in conjunction with lifespan. And in that experiment, the effects of the drugs, if you actually do the math, the, the, the drugs just add on to each other. So it's not that they enhance each other's effects or that they block each other's effects. They just add on. In humans, I think there are two things I'd say. We don't know what would happen if we put those drugs together at low doses. We are doing the drug combinations in mice, by the way, but I, I just don't have the results on that yet. We don't know in humans. But one of the standard things with drugs in humans, if you're going after a particular target and you want to reduce side effects, is to target it with different drugs that affect it by different mechanisms. So their side effects are different. So they combine to inhibit what the target is, but they each independently have different side effects, which of course are lower, because you can use lower doses to get the same inhibition of the target. And that may turn out to be important in the context that we're talking about, because we don't know what that mechanism is in the flight by which those drugs add on to each other. Um, you know, that's something that we can go into and in the mice where we're doing the drug combinations. But it, depending what the mechanism is, it might be very useful if we can use it to reduce side effects, actually. Yeah, I think that's a big challenge. And, you know, I think I agree with you completely, but it's already a challenge to do the dosing experiment with one drug in a mouse and then starting to combine them together and look for lower doses that synergizes, you know, really hasn't been done almost at all to this point. And I think it's just such a big experiment that it's very limiting. So, but I think yeah. you're right conceptually. So. Well, of course, for all of these things, what would be absolutely fantastic is if we could treat for days or weeks and have really powerful biomarkers that then tell us what's actually going to happen much later in the life of the animal. So the hunt is really on now for indicators in all these organisms that give us some prediction of what the late life effects of that intervention are going to be. That, that's really going to speed things up if we can get those. Definitely. Do you, do you have one last burning question, Shini? We do have one more from David. Uh, he mentions, you know, there are many hallmarks of aging that can be potential targets to improve healthy longevity in humans. Uh, in your opinion, which ones do you think we should be targeting and why? Um, I'm very interested in what the people who work on cell senescence are doing. So senescent cells are ones that are usually produced in the context of wound healing, tissue repair, and also development to remodel tissues. And when the process is over, the immune system comes along and removes them. That fails in old age. 
and they sit spitting out cytokines and causing trouble in tissues. And they're very clearly involved in the etiology, for instance, of osteoarthritis, um, AMD in the eye, and other age-related diseases. They're there in the etiology. And people are developing senolytic drugs that selectively kill those cells. And I think the concept there is that actually they're rather toxic if they go systemic in a human or, or in an animal. But some of these diseases affect really compartmentalised bits of the body, like a joint, the knee joint, for instance, or the eye. And it may be possible, therefore, to target them to specific regions of the body to get rid of those cells. I think it would be really fantastic if that turns out to work. I think drugs that reduce age-related inflammation are going to be very important because it is clearly such a major player in human ageing. It's present in all the model organisms too, but in humans it seems to be really important. And I think drugs that target the nutrient sensing network because of metabolic disease, that those would be the ones I'd be really interested in at the moment. You know, I think our prospects for instance of reducing DNA damage are much more remote. I think that's a less accessible target than the three that I've mentioned. Well, you know, thanks a lot, Linda. We'll have to do this again. It's great having you on the show. And we, you know, we did we talked about diet and exercise. Uh, we didn't talk about the role of sleep and aging, but I'm going to focus on that for the next few hours. Um, for the sleep well. <laughs> thanks for the uh, guests. Please use the panelists and all attendees option to put comments about the show, and uh, there can be discussion there. Check the credits of the show for news about the Center for Healthy Longevity, and also from the School of Medicine. Uh, next week, we'll have Lene Rasmussen on, and we'll be talking about uh, aspects of aging. She's from University of Copenhagen, and I'm going to leave you with uh, some of the things that seniors are up to to bring us into a greener world. Thanks a lot. Oh, I'm in Wendy. I'm in the ECC, called Le Ling Ren Si Xue Zou Mao Fu. Our class is the leader of the class. The most young people are 50 years old. The most old people are 70 to 80 years old. 通常呢，有些人就说：“哇，乐龄了还可以走猫步啊？乐龄不是年轻人的吗？”我是觉得很多人都没有注意他们的组织。我教这个模特儿已经教了十年，有上过那个模特儿学校吗？我知道模特儿行动比较轻便，所以我就出来教他们乐龄人士走猫步，这样就比较写意。一个乐龄人士，你组织好看啊，人家都感觉你健康。我们每个月啊。都会有最少都有两次去 CC 啊或者老人院表演，好像那天我们在楼下表演，我们一上台，他们说模特儿的这班是模特儿来的，他们就会这样有粉丝的哦，我们真的很不错的。家人会来看，有时候会的，他们有时候会叫孩子女儿来看的，我的我的孩子他们有空，他也是会来看，他们就会夸奖我说哇。妈妈，你真的不错嘞！你做这个很好哎，我就会觉得很有满足感，觉得真的是我走对了。Nothing gonna bring me down.